happening now. So um, welcome very much. Welcome to the uh, Black Letter Brunch. Um, our presenter today is uh, Gemma Black, uh, art artist, graphic designer, and calligrapher for, and, for, and teacher from, from Australia. And uh, she had to get up very early this morning to attend this. Uh, so thank you very much, Gemma. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Raul. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And um, it's going to be sort of a little bit of a wacky old chat. So do feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. And um, so I might just um, go straight into my PowerPoint, and that's just going to help us get along for the next hour or so. Here we go. So hopefully you got on the screen my PowerPoint presentation in full swing. Is that correct? Yeah, I can see your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. And um, so welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see such familiar faces. I feel quite humbled, but also a little bit excited to talk about um, what goes into making me um, who I am. Um, and I think from some of these unusual images that you're going to see that you'll you'll understand that coming from a different part of the world does influence the way you um, your, your being is and how you see the world and how you see yourself in the world and the way you see your art. Um, in the world. I am an Antipodean girl, which is, of course, anyone that comes from Australia or New Zealand. Mm. Just a bit of fun there. Uh, don't faint, but there's not just one of me. There's eight others, um, and we're all the same. We all look the same. We all grew up in Sydney, home of the Gadigal people, the original people of this land. And um, of course, the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge, they were our playground when we were children. So you can imagine running around places like this when, when we were kids. We were just told, off you go, and it didn't matter whether you got on a bus or, or you went to the beach. So, you know, this, these are the people that shaped my life. Uh, from Canberra, Oh, sorry, from Sydney. Oh, actually, I went to Canberra first. But anyway, this is uh, Lutruita, Tasmania. Um, I know at least one person in the room who's climbed this mountain, um, Kununye. Um, maybe two people in this room have climbed Kununye. And it's a very beautiful place. It's a place of wilderness, and it's a place where you can actually just go and be by yourself in the wilderness. Um, or be with other people and fight the wilderness and truly enjoy um, what Mother Nature has to offer us. So I moved to Canberra first and then to Tasmania, and now I'm back in Canberra, um, home of the uh, Ngunnawal people. And this is what Canberra is like at the moment. I didn't take this photograph. I picked it off um, Wikipedia, I think. <laughs> Um, because I couldn't get a really lovely photo of Canberra, but we're in autumn now, and it's it's truly beautiful. Um, I often talk about the land and where I come from, and even some of the pieces that I've written talks about the way where you live shapes your life. Um, so I think it just gives you a little bit of an idea of where I'm coming from. You can actually see almost um, here Nagambra was an Aboriginal word um, as well as Nagambri, and it ended up being Canberra because the English speakers couldn't pronounce Nagambra. And staying on my um, uh, Australian theme, we have here in Australia Indigenous artwork that dates back to uh, you know, 30 odd thousand years, although I'm not going to stay with the Indigenous art, but 
um, growing up in Australia, you cannot avoid being part of um, the Aboriginality uh, story of this country. We all had didgeridoos, we had boomerangs, we had, um, you know, cultural materials uh, that were freely available to use um, uh, and enjoy and to understand in this country. Um, dating Aboriginal artwork is very difficult and rather than dating the artwork itself, which of course was the Aboriginal narrative and the story of their time here, um, it's dated mostly because of the tools and the materials found at various um, campsites around the country, if I'm talking flints, et cetera. Um, so just as uh, Indigenous artwork all around the world has informed, um, uh, you know, certain races, their stories, so too here in Australia. And of course, we we are able to take advantage of beautiful ochre colours uh, here in this country. But not only is there rock art and cave art, but we have these, these chiringas that are carved stones, little stones that have been carved with flints. And I can't help but feel this real, um, you know, pull to the other side of the world when you see something like the Karinga here on the, on the right. But let's leave that for now because I just wanted to start there so that we could, you could get a little bit of an idea about where I'm coming from as a calligrapher. But this is where, you know, we join forces um, with the, the Lascaux Cave uh, in the valley, in the Lascaux Valley in France, where our story, yours and mine, uh, and all calligraphers of the Roman ilk, um, go right back to the Aleph. And on the right-hand side is a story I wrote about the evolution of the Western alphabet being a wonderful story of 26 letters, each with individual character and purpose, a magical, majuscular journey of time, peoples, cultures, and creeds, where um, there's, a, there's a sort of lineage there running through this piece of work. And this was done for the Australian Society of Calligraphers in 1998. It's about A3 in size, so that's uh, your double letter size. Uh, it's wonderful being a calligrapher or a maker of written artifacts or a scribe or a scrivener. Um, but this image I particularly like, as well as the um, Pompeii girl, um, and the frescoes on the wall of Pompeii indicate um, who they are, and also who we are. I'm sure there's a lot of other things, other names we can add to this, but these ones will get us through. A lot of very familiar photos here for you. Um, and I'm depicting the scribe here in particular in this hieroglyph because we can all relate to the flat palette that the scribes used with uh, the red and the black. But I rather see myself not quite so much as uh, this particular Egyptian scribe, but rather like these scribes. This is one of my favorite little images of scribes and I use it all the time. And this is how I see my life. I. I am just like these scribes here. I'm a bit of a go-getter and I, you know, just got my finger in every pie. Um, and so I thought I'd show you this image, not because, I mean, you all know, of course, who they are and where it comes from, but, and this is our history, um, but rather I see myself as one of these, just get in and do it sort of thing. And of course, you know, the, the pinnacle of where we come from. And um, is this your photograph, Carl? If so, I didn't it, know that. You... It might be. Yeah, it, it certainly looks like yours, but I wasn't too sure whether you took it straight on like that. I um, take a straight on one. And then I, the one I really liked was the, the angle. Yeah. 
off to the side. Yeah. And so I was pretty certain that this was yours. So um, uh, reference to Carl Rawls for this particular photograph. And of course, for those that haven't been, um, the the um, it's down behind these pillars down here. It's only right at the bottom of the Trajan column. But I I've taken this along with the rest of you um, to mean something very important in our lives. And it's we strive for the, um, the, the pinnacle um, of form. Ah, I forgot I put that one in there. So this one was... Um, created, let's say, the, the inscriptions on the um, Appian Way and uh, outside of Rome. And there's my eyes coming through the stone. Uh, and there I am obviously using a quill <laughs> with all the barbs still in it. But this was done in 1993 and it was part of an exhibition called Sense of Self. And um, because I didn't want to use the Trajan inscription. I wanted to use something a little less perfect because I feel that that's what um, I am. We are. Um, and almost as if I'm always going to see my way through regardless. So I've taken those letters, just like all of you, and have used them in a variety of ways. But one of the ways I really enjoy um, using the Trajan inscription is in this watercolour uh, watercolor cutback technique. And it's something that I learned in art school where um, you create one series of letters. So in this, this large one, this is a very big piece of work, um, ABC and XYZ were done first and then you paint the background, and then you draw the next layer of letter form. So these are all hand-drawn um, Trajan letters. And so the last layer uh, was actually the depths in there, um, going into the P's and the K's right in the background. Um, so this is an early piece. This is probably 1999. Um, and this is a more recent one. And when I have nothing to do, I, I like to do skeleton Roman capitals. I just draw skeleton Roman capitals. And before, you know, like if I want to sort of warm up, uh, I'll just do skeleton Roman capitals. I just adore them. And they're so versatile. Um, and, you know, as you all know, they are. And understanding those proportions and being able to draw them with a pencil is, is really uh, fundamentally who I am. And from doing that, something as looks as simple as the skeleton Roman, all of a sudden you start moving into something else. Um, I find it's a really good way to just ground myself because you have to sit still. Uh, this country has a habit of doing atrocious things to people um, and I think it probably starts from our colonial past. Many countries, of course, are the same and not naive enough to know that it's just us. Um, the Apology to Australia's Indigenous People is a work I did in 2008 when our Prime Minister apologised to the stolen generation. And they were stolen. Children were taken from Aboriginal parents, you know, loving mothers and fathers and um and taken to uh, missions and to camps, sent to other parts of the country. Um, I know a group of boys who were taken from, you know, the hot of Arnhem Land and sent to Melbourne to be educated. Um, and it was time that this country uh, apologised to the stolen generation. Um, it goes beyond that. Uh, we're still... We're still, even though an apology was made, it's not the answer. And I don't think that the complete lack of respect for the people that were here um, will actually ever um, leave them. Um, so this document that I did was my first uh, apology. I was actually working for the government and I said to them, you know, if you do this on a piece of skin, calf skin, it's going to last for a thousand years. 
And so that all our generations that come after us will, in fact, never forget what we did um, uh, to the uh, Aboriginal people. And of course, that stain on our history still remains, regardless um, of the apology. Um, it goes some of the way, but of course, not all of the way. So this, this, to me, was the biggest problem that Australia faced or faces still uh, in the future. And we are just about to go to um, a referendum on giving um, Indigenous Australians a vote, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, a voice in Parliament. And that's going to happen in a couple of months' time where the Australian people, not the politicians, the Australian people will choose to give Aboriginal people a voice in Parliament. And basically what that means is that they will be able to influence the laws of this country. You know, we've only just realised that um, the Aboriginal people who lived here for hundreds of thousands of years actually do know how to work with fire, work with floods and so forth. Uh, this is just the italic that I used for that particular apology. And this is where that apology sits. It's in a hermetically sealed cabinet in Parliament House. Um, and this is how somebody would view it. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get a photograph of it because the light is very low. And though there's a bit of gold work on it, uh, it's very difficult to see. And I purposely made the document completely un, un um, on, uh, what's the word, uh, ornamental or on, over ornate, because it wasn't about that. It was actually about the wording. And this is the forecourt of our Parliament House. And it's just, you go straight in those front doors, up the stairs, and there it is. And, but it's not the only apology that this country has had to make um, to a variety of people who came to our shores. Um, in the, this is the beginning of uh, the next document that I'm going to show you. This is our home in Blackman's Bay. And I would work on this sloped surface with a roll, uh, this thick cardboard roll that I had to put at the bottom of my drawing board so that when I'm working on the vellum, which you'll see in the next shot is very, very large skin, um, it needed to go under and around that roll and across the top of my lap. So it was very important to have that set up just right. So here is the uh, apology to the forgotten Australians, the former child migrants. That's actually what this apology is called. So basically in the 1950s and 60s, children, of course, sent out from the UK um, and uh, to, to lands beyond um, their, <laughs> their, um, their knowledge, uh, and put into institutions and homes, and they were mostly orphans, not all, but mostly orphans, um, people down on their luck. They all came from England, um, mostly England. Of course, convicts mostly came from Ireland. And so this was an apology to those people who rallied the government or lobbied the government for an apology because many, many of those people became um, uh, there was, well, you'll see in one of the other apologies that's coming up, they were sexually abused, they became um, very poor, they were sent out in the world with no real education, they were treated harshly. And so this was an apology uh, to those people. Some people um, rallied and one of them became the head of our ABC, which is our Australian Broadcasting Network. And he was one of the, David Hill was one of the people that really pushed for this apology. And again, it's on calfskin and it tells the story. So again, I've kept it um, completely free. Well, not completely free, but free of ornamentation. Um, I chose to use small little illuminated letters to give it uh, some importance or some recognition. And so, of course, the first thing that I do is all the lettering 
Uh, there was quite a few hundred words on this one. It was a lot longer than the apology to Australia's Indigenous people. And so the first thing I do is all the lettering, okay? And then the next thing I do is I pop in these little illuminated letters. Here we go. The very next thing I do is I gild those letters uh, because the gold, as you know, will stick to um, uh, gouache. Uh, there's the ones on the other side. And you can see that when I've done the gilding, I've also done the gilding on the coat of arms, right? Um, excuse me, um, Gemma. Uh, so what did you use? I, maybe I missed that. I'm sorry. As Did you use some type of um, uh, ink, um, oak gall ink for the, for the script? I used... Um, stick ink. I use a Korean stick ink for all my formal work. I use a Korean stick ink for all my work, actually, all my black ink work. Um, it's a pure carbon that has been um, held together with an animal glue that once it's dry, it is waterproof. <clears throat> that is for the ink. The gold here, I've used gum ammoniacum um, because we know that the gum ammoniacum size so that's the traditional size. So it's even though it's flat gilding, um, it looks a little bit raised there. And that's just because I put a lot on. <laughs> um, and then I lay the gold on the top of that. Okay, thank you. I think that might help. Um, and once I've uh, done all the illuminated letters, um, and of course, all the writing is done. This is the time where I get to sit back and relax. And the slide isn't upside down. It's because I actually sit and do the coat of arms upside down, quite simply because the document is so long that I can't do it. Uh, I don't want to risk having it going around underneath on my lap and to, to paint um, that coat of arms. And so with the coat of arms, I choose to use a variety of um, watercolour pencils, particularly for the kangaroo and the emu. And um, the gold, as you saw, was done first, uh, and then shell gold and shell silver. And our coat of arms is a rather uh, simple coat of arms. And this is a 1912 coat of arms is our original. And so I am copying the exact original coat of arms. It is our official coat of arms. I can't vary from it. And I wouldn't want to. And I tried to get an image of it on the side um, just so that you could see how lovely the gold is on the wattle, which is our national floral emblem. And so that's a, a front on view of the um, the little illuminated letters, and they're Owen Jones illuminated letters. And the italic is um, not overly flourished. It's quite lovely. Um, the calfskin vellum is beautiful to write on, and you get a really gorgeous response to your work. And there's that full manuscript or document. As you can see, it is quite long, and it's just a matter of getting the writing done, putting yourself in a frame of mind where you're very professional. And I tend to read these documents first and then sort of get over the emotional side of it uh, and then, uh, then you know, just sit and write. Um, like everywhere else in the world, this country would not allow unwed mothers and so children were forcibly taken from young girls from, you know, in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Um, in this country, we are trying to um, bring in a law to, to um, ban uh, forced adoption in this country. Uh, it still does happen, but the majority, of course, were uh, in the 50s, the 60s and the 70s. And this document is a very important document for me. Um, we have just had the 10th anniversary of this document only just uh, a week or so ago which was very emotional and I always get invited. Um, so again, uh, what happened to a lot of those women and, uh, and men? So we're talking about the adoptees um, and the mothers um, 
it's it's not really so much about the adoptive parents, although um, there are adoptive parents who are extremely supportive of apologies to um, the young mothers who were treated quite badly. And of course, a lot of um, people, a lot of women or young girls were not even sent to homes. They were just sent. Um, so we have a pretty tragic history here in this country. But, um, you know, for me to be able to create a document like this, or these documents so that they're going to last and they're on view in Parliament House so that, except for one of them, it's in the National Archive. Um, this is the latest apology and the last apology. And we've just had a big debate in this country about um, do national apologies mean anything? Do they do anything? Um, well, certainly at the time they do. Uh, and, of course, the number of children that were um, sexually abused in a variety of institutions around Australia, it's the same around the world. We're no different in that, uh, in that way. Um, but not only um, institutional, institutionalised sexual abuse, but also all those unknown um, sexual abuses in homes. And, and to create a document, uh, each one of my documents are different. Um, I don't want any of them to be the same. So as you can see, they've all changed. Um, my images are not all that fantastic, but they're, they're ones I've taken myself and I think they sort of give you an idea. So I thought I'd share those with you. It's always nice sharing tools and materials. So this was just after the first apology. Gemma, can I, can I interrupt just for a sec? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, this is sort of like... <laughs> uh, not pertinent to the important subject matter you did, but in the coat of arms, is that a cassowary or an emu? That's the bird, just yeah. out of curiosity. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, it's, a, it's an emu. So it's a smaller version of the ostrich. And, uh, and in the coat of arms, we always can pick out the very badly designed coat of, coats of arms because um, the emu must, uh, let me just go back one. I uh, can hardly see it here. But the emu, because it has no hands, and in heraldry, um, the animals must hold up the shield, right? So on occasion, we'll find, uh, we'll see the emu has no hands. This is just an aside. Um, so the breast of the emu must sit right on the shield and on occasion you'll see some coats of arms you know stylized coats of arms particularly metals or woods etc that uh it's not uh it's not quite so or just so oh uh, this i did this in the 1990s and it was my first attempt at uh, a coat of arms and it's the mclaren coat of arms which was my mother's family it's quite naive um, but I still think it's quite sweet. Um, I work collaboratively with a lot of people, and this is um, a couple that I like to work with, John and Joy Tonkin. This is um, uh, here of Canberra, and it doesn't matter where I've been living, but I've always worked collaboratively with them. Um, this is pigskin uh, covers on uh, this declaration for, of modern slavery, declaration against modern slavery. Um, and it was commissioned by the Mindaroo Corporation um, to create these two identical books all by hand to be hand bound. And to the Mindaroo Corporation is owned by um, Andrew Forrest, who is a mining magnate in this country. Um, and he and his wife, um, run this company and they are anti-slavery. They've put a lot of their money into modern to, to modern slavery. Um, and this book travels the world collecting signatures of dign dignitaries, uh, from dignitaries uh, from the Pope right down through uh, all of society, um, um, leaders in every walk of life and right down to the man in the street. Um, can be offered to sign the Joint Declaration Against Modern Slavery. So every page is handwritten and 
Joy, John and I worked on this uh, probably for about a year where two books were produced and hand bound. Um, and again, this is in um, Blackman's Bay in Tasmania. Now, this is just a snap of two of the of the two books that John and Joy have um, bound from all my um, sheets, my um, choirs. And these two books go into their, I haven't got a shot, I do have a shot somewhere, but I couldn't find it, into um, their, their slip cases, which are um, Solander boxes that seal beautifully. So these books go into the Solander boxes, and then those Solander boxes go into two metal suitcases that are locked and carried around the world by the Mindaroo Corporation. So basically what we're talking about here is that in the hotel down the street, you might not know that there are people who are being kept there, uh, people brought into the country and their passports taken away from them and they've been set to work. Um, so yeah, this happens every day. Um, I don't know if it's going to solve any problems, but uh, here we have one of the pages uh, and this is written in, ba is it ba um, the Indonesian language Bahai, ba, not Bahai, Bashi. Anyway, so it's all written in Indonesia. This particular one is uh, by the Indonesian Freedom Net Network. And whenever, uh, I don't know what's wrong with, um, anyway, so every now and then I get to go to Perth to um, put, to, to add some sheets into this book, to slip some sheets. But when a little commission comes along, that you have to recreate the coat of arms and recreate the logo type that goes with that coat of arms. You know, I had to do something like eight um, documents from go to woe. And each one of these, it, it's a dream job. You just sit there and thoroughly enjoy yourself creating the coat of arms, the logo type, and then the information that has to go on the document. And this is when I find myself in absolute pure joy in what I do. Um, so these uh, certificates, the heritage certificates that are given out in this country uh, every year um, to scientists who, you know, develop or do something. Uh, but to be, at, so even the Commonwealth of Australia is all done by hand and you all know how to do that. It's just, just pure joy creating um, this type of work. Every now and then a job will come along that is so long that there's nothing you can do with it except write it. 80 lines of um, the poem um, written by, um, oh gosh, it's um, Ben Johnston, of course, um, about Shakespeare, his contemporary. And she wanted purple. So this is actually all in purple. It's not in black. So you just do it basically and hope that you don't make a mistake. I love type. Um, I, I'm not, I don't have anything to do with type other than I've got a lot of type and every now and then I just take it out and play with it. Um, um, I, italic is my go-to script for most uh, things that I do. And this was a little design for um, uh, a B and B here in um, New South Wales, just outside of Canberra, the Artigat Villa. Uh, and so I just worked on this until I got it to a stage where the customer was happy with it, and then just let it go. And um, but the italics that I use, the two italics that I use, um, are the uh, Bartolomeo San Vito. Of course, he wrote the Bembo sonnets for Pietro Bembo um, uh, on behalf of his son, I think, organised for it to be commissioned. And so I use the Bembo sonnets as my, that was my training ground for italic. Um, but then later on, so I'm talking back in the 80s, this is when I started the study of italic, and that was our prime specimen model to use. Um, but I also use of course, um, a Benedino Cataneo um, or Catania, um, the scribe of Siena, whose, whose italic I find to be 
extremely refined. He was a writing master. Some of you will know him, and probably all of you will know him, um, made famous by Stephen Harvard's book uh, called An Italic Copy Book. So they're the two italics um, that I, you know, sort of build my own italic on. Um, and I never, ever will create an italic or any other letter form um, that I don't make my own. You, you can usually tell because we all have those characteristics that make us who we are and it comes through in our letter form. I love making little books. I just make lots of little books. And these, we all do, I think. That's a bit crooked, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. They go to nice little homes. Paste papers. I've got so much paste paper, like it's coming out my ears. I made so much paste paper in the 1980s that I never need to make paste paper ever again. The Blue Books of Love. These books are held in, um, you know, love is blue really, isn't it? So these are three little individual books. Um, they're concertina and they've got uh, perspex covers. Um, and uh, one of them is held by the Letterform Archive and two others are in private collections. And they're really gorgeous little books um, about love, love's coming. Uh-huh. And so the paper has all been hand dyed uh, and I had the little perspex covers made um, to fit uh, the books and I've hand dyed the covers with um, uh, schoolgirl ink, let's call it schoolgirl ink, you know those little um, sachets that we used to make the, the quartz turn into four quarts of ink. Uh, when we were kids, so I still had some of those. So I hand dyed the paper and also used a bit of walnut ink. And then the lettering, of course, is all um, in pencil. Pencil. Um, these are a couple of books that I made while I was on residency in Venice at the uh, International School of Graphic Design or the Squala. I like books. I like um, gilding. Um, I do a lot of both traditional and modern gilding, and I've just finished. I'll quickly go through these because they're basically just, um, you know, they're just little snippets of the sorts of things that I do. So um, I was talking to Raul yesterday about not, um, I, I'm, I can't be pigeonholed. Um, I do a little bit of everything, traditional, um, contemporary, you know, I guess I'm a Jill of all trades or a Jack of all trades. Um, uh, this is the gilding. Uh, that's on vellum. This is the one on vellum. The next one's on paper. So I work on vellum and I work on paper. can actually even see the pores, the little holes here, the pores of the skin. Uh, again, gilding on gum ammoniacum. Uh, I find it very difficult to photograph black. But so what you're seeing are just images that I've taken. Um, I can't emphasize enough to my students um, to do their swatches. If it works on the swatch, it's going to work on your piece of work. I mean, it's as simple as that. Just always do your swatches um, and gold tooling. Uh, again, I really love just sitting and doing those very fine filigrees. Um, so this one is on paper. Um, and showing people how to do that. Uh, these are Owen Jones uh, illuminations and gold tooling. I mean, that that the gold tooling and stuff's mine, but the basic letter form is the Owen Jones. And here you can see a couple of other older images. These ones are quite old now. Um, there's a lot of gold, um, and I'm not really a blingy sort of person, um, these are all the sgraffito technique. So you lay a colour on a substrate underneath and then on top of that colour you lay gold leaf. And I always use um, genuine gold leaf. I don't use imitation gold leaf. Um, and uh, the one in the middle is a little booklet that I made, a triangular book out of wood. The one on the left is on paper and the, the one on the right is actually also on a little wooden um, tablet and you scratch through the surface to reveal the color underneath 
gold there's gold everywhere and like I said I'm really not a blingy sort of person but um the gold sort of does something little bits of gold does something um you'll all know about the Museum of International Calligraphy in Moscow if you don't um that doesn't matter there is a, a great museum there that collects um or acquires calligraphy from around the world and this is a hand dyed piece of paper a pot boiled piece of paper or eco dyed um, done in the early, early 2000s and this was um, and these were actually white rose petals and with the addition of the iron mordant that I used um, this is the resulting color that I received and every time you do one of these um, you know sessions with pot boiling you always come out with two identical pieces right so I had two identical pieces and as I said they were white rose petals from my garden roses in my garden and this was the result and so I wrote uh, I'm a versals person as you will see in a minute um, I, I draw letters, I, I compound them, I, I adore drawn capital letters, and it takes, it goes right back to those early um, training days, my Roehampton days with Trajan and my days with um, Thomas Ingmeyer and, you know, drawing the Trajan letter to the finest degree. Um, and this is all done in pencil. And again, some more pot boiled paper. Um, I really enjoyed um, doing eco dyeing, as it's called these days. We used to call it pot boiling when I was younger. So, this is what happens when you work for some companies and you make a design that's going to really be, you know, how exciting to have the Folio Society of London send you an email to say, we'd like you to design the cover of the Revelations of Divine Love. And so I thought, gee, I better, I better read the book. <laughs> so I did. I read the Revelations of Divine Love, even though I knew about Julian of Norwich, um, the anchoress that was holed up in the wall in, um, in Norwich church anyway so I designed this lovely versals of course here revelations of design love on the left hand side um, and I don't think that that was actually the finished piece but that it was the finished design and of course on the right this is what I received and you know it's just all wrong because that wasn't the way I designed it but they wanted that, and I didn't even design it as a religious cross. I just put it in there. And um, so I really was not happy, but in a way I'm sort of happy that I've done a book for the Folio Society. It, the name of the book is Revelations of Divine Love. So why would you put Revelations over there on the right? Anyway, it's what we do. But inside the book are a whole lot of line drawings of these gorgeous little um, Jones style letters. I'll be quick now because I'm really talking too much. Hmm. Okay, Versals. I'm a Versals freak. Um, here's a shot of my um, ink stick and my ink stone on the bottom right. Uh, so I use two different ones. I use this beautiful little um, vermilion ink stick at the top. Uh, with its own little um, ink stone uh, there you can see so they're the two ink stones getting right back to those early black and red Egyptians um, they're the two stones that I stick sticks and stones <laughs> so just a quick go through some versals lots of little versal pieces hundreds of versal pieces I love versals um, and it, it's funny because somebody put up on Facebook, it was a year or so ago, maybe two years ago now, time goes so fast these days, um, a piece of work that was actually mine and no one knew who it was. And Julian Waters chimed in with, oh, that's we know that's Gemma Black's versals. So these ones on the right-hand side, I try to encourage my students to actually use their own hand and their own sweep of the, the pen to create their own letter, not my letters, their letters. 
um, sometimes they try to recreate mine uh, with not a great deal of success, whereas I, I quite like mine for me, but I try to instill in them to, to, to try the letter and but put your own um, swing on it or, or, or swash on it. Um, so these are my vivacious versals. Uh, inspired always by the landscape. So this piece that was done in my residency, which is not a great shot, was, of course, inspired by uh, travelling back and forth across the lagoon in Venice. Um, I do like a little bit of watercolour. Uh, this is the nature of geometry which I think you've all seen, thanks to Carl. Um, I do like a little bit of watercolour <laughs> uh, and designing, just starting out with drawing skeleton letters and then adding weights regardless, not a particular script. I'll just go through some people who I'm heavily influenced by, um, David Jones, the author, the Welsh author, poet, and here uh, is he in his study with uh, one of his most... Um, highly refined pieces of work uh, and there it is behind him on the wall so it gives you an idea of actually how um, uh, how big that piece of work is written in um, uh, alternating lines of Welsh and Latin um, one of the most beautiful paintings I think I've ever seen is by David Jones and it's the Madonna and child. And I've never seen a Madonna and child quite so beautiful as this. And it is in um, that Mecca of all places, uh, Ditchling. And it's a place I've been to four times. And this painting is held there. And David Jones painted it for um, as an engagement present to uh, the daughter of Eric Gill, whom he ended up not marrying. She broke it off. But as I said, I'm very heavily influenced by certain things and this one um, for everything that it means as well as being such a beautiful Madonna and child an oil painting at Ditchling. Um, a few of us in the past 20 or so years have been influenced by um, David Jones. Um, what interests me with this little piece here, this was an in-class example, I end up getting lots of examples from, you know, working in class. Uh, this was an Edward Johnston's quote, and it was actually the, the text that I liked, um, what he had written. My text was once your textile and my writing line your linen thread. And it was given to a friend of his in Ditchling when he was working there in his um, younger days. Um, the skeleton Romans come in my work all the time. Uh, they're just always there. Uh, if I want to do anything, build texture, I just do skeleton Romans. Whether they're weighted or not makes no difference to me. Um, so I teach this course called um, React and Respond. It's called Calligraphy React Respond. So it's you, st you start with nothing and you just lay a mark on the page and then you build from there. So basically the materials that you need is your critical eye. And so you end up building and building and building until you get to a stage where, and you know, there's no lines, there's no planning, there's no nothing. You just do it. Um, and I started to work this way because I met a mosaic artist in Tasmania when I was living there and became great friends. Um, oh, heavily uh, influenced by uh, Neudorfer. Um, and here's an image, a painting of the Nuremberg master and his student. So just quickly now, I'll go through all these people that have influenced me um, and you'll be able to see in my work, uh, not so much the um, fractal or the black letter. That's not my um, area of expertise. But this um, this uh, new Dorfer's teaching manual is just fantastic, and I know a number of you have seen it, and it is available online. 
for you to be able to go through. And I love this one. I mean, it's it's so old. We're in the 1500s. And here we see null a die sign linear. So basically, it's something that we see calligraphers write over and over and over and over again these days. Even I've written it a couple of times. Never a day without a line. Extraordinary work. And then, of course, the Toya Dunk, which is a fictional story um, that was created for the um, for Maximilian. And it's, it's really quite an interesting, I, I have the whole Toya Dunk here. It's it's exquisite to look at and to think that in the fifth, I mean, I know you guys, you know, who are really into type and you know a lot of history about type, to think that they created these wood blocks and these type all that time ago and created these wonderful, wonderful books. Um, I wanted to put the colophon, I wanted to put on the right-hand side here that blow up the colophon, but basically it, it just tells us that it was um, printed in, Nurem, in Nuremberg um, and by, uh, what's his name, Schuen, 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 <laughs> anyway, it's gone. Um, Schoen, Schoensberger? Yes, thank you. <laughs> but what I particularly like is this image. And this is um, Maximilian as a child. And this depiction is his tutor teaching him um, textura. So this is an original um, uh, vellum piece. Uh, and it's, it's using, of course, the grid method that medieval scribes used to create their, their works. And it's a way that I teach using the grid method these days. But this is a fine, fine example of the textura and how wonderful um, to see um, Maximilian there as a child. Um, a Neugebauer, of course. I'll quickly, quickly go through this because we're getting up to, to time. Uh, here's an image of Neugebauer when his work was being collected. Um, and you will all know the book, uh, The Mystic Art of Written Forms, and it has such an array uh, of styles of work um, uh, Frederick has created in his lifetime. Uh, and this is what he said um, at the Bodle House when his work was opened there. Now it is my turn to pass on the delicious heritage. I'm therefore happy that a promising home for script has been found today, which unfor unfortunately was not granted to my honoured teachers at the time. Active, enthusiastic idealists now want to preserve and care for my calligraphic works with me in this beautiful house and give them a home. How wonderful. And of course, um, the beginning of autumn and this poem by um, um, Austrian author, Richard Billinger. His lovely fracture, but not only does the fracture have to be, um, you know, written out in straight lines, how beautiful is this lovely piece on the right? You've probably actually all got this book, so I'll just very quickly. But his, his work does influence me. And what a beautiful Bruckner, Anton Bruckner, um, the, the um, um, composer, a really lovely written Bruckner. And um, two things, I never recreate um, work other than studying and trialling originals. Um, I never really recreate it. I always change it so that it becomes mine, not theirs. Um, but one of the books that has seen me through my lettering career, and I'm so glad I came across lettering as drawing when I was a, I was going to say a child, but a child calligrapher, let's put it that way, um, because it informed the way that I understood what calligraphy was all about, that book by Nicolette Bray. Um, again, you've probably all got it and I'm probably not telling you anything, but I took this piece of work from that book 
and I gave it to um, a group of students, quite advanced students, but not that advanced, obviously. And I said, you know, is this a contemporary piece or a traditional piece, an old piece? And they all said, oh, recent, very recent, very contemporary. Well, of course it's not. Um, as you'll all know, it's a papal bull and it's a 12th century. And how stunning is it? I, I'm just in awe of that form uh, of the lowercase there on the right-hand side. Um, no one's going to be able to repeat that, that's for sure. Well, I know some people here who could. And again, Rudolf Koch. Uh, so Rudolf Koch and Hermann Killian and um, Hermann Zaff you know, Neugebauer, these people from Middle Europe, just amazing, amazing essence to their lives. And this is a couple of photos I took when I was in the um, Schreiberg start. Uh, no, I wasn't there. Where was I? I was in um, Klingspool. <laughs> uh, it's nice to get some close-ups, the texture of the paper and the ink on the paper. You know, there's real life in this work by Rudolf Koch. And that's what I love. Uh, this was a handmade book by him, and it was the um, the Gospel of St. John, the Evangelist. There's something really wonderful about looking at originals. Uh, <laughs> we've all seen this image, but taken without the glass in front of it. But this was the one that I took in um, uh, the scribe work start in, uh, no, so no, I was in the archive. Sorry, got that one wrong again. Um, in the uh, Maria and Karl Gorg Hoofer's archive in Offenbach. One of the most famous Rudolf Koch's works. And of course, you're not uh, seeing anything new here, particularly um, all you black letter aficionados. I have a number of books written by Hermann Zaff, actually. Some lovely, lovely books. Even that little manual that he wrote for teaching calligraphy is gorgeous. Killian, of course, is a, is a huge um, influence, um, not only to me, but also um, my beautiful friend here, Yukimi, um, friend and colleague, and just we're, you know, blown away by his work, his... Um, his style, but again, not able to be pigeonholed into one particular style, a bit like, like um, Neugebauer in that sense, where um, master of all, I would say, and that's a little catalogue, and I'm not going to go into all his work, but, um, you know, it's just a very exciting part of the last century that letter form became so exciting. Uh, you could move into realms that were okay to move to, particularly when you started out, or well, some of us started out so rigid to be able to see and do something like this. So this particular script I'm extremely taken by, um, and I am doing a very large project using this, this script. Um, this is my teaching module for that style. I'll just quickly, these are just some of mine. Um, bouncing off um, Herman Killian. Uh, and I wish people around the world would spell his name correctly. Um, so it's, it's just sort of bouncing off him. It's not him. It's not his hand, it's my hand. It just has that feel of Killian, uh, but used in a variety of ways. Okay, I think we're sort of just at the end now. Um, I just love letters in all their ilk. Um, yeah, this, I mean, just to see the paper and the you know, looking at the gouache on the paper and the quality of the ink. And uh, so that was just a cadmium red gouache with a carbon black ink stick there on the right. Something so simple. 
um, I have been heavily influenced by um, uh, Herman Killian's love of time, time features in all his work, pretty much in all his work. My um, fractal is just not up to scratch. <laughs> but when you have a client that wants you to have something like 20 images in a piece of work, you think, oh, go away. So this per piece of work was done on vellum and there's nothing better than working on vellum. I have to say it is so beautiful and it has that real rich a quality after you work with the, the gouache and the materials. If you're using good materials, you're going to get a good result with a good skin. Um, um, so, yes, uh, this was just an in-class demonstration, but I love the way the, the ink, the wetness of the ink has pulled that paper into um, its, its cockled or its stretched uh, not stretched, it's shrunk, shrunken form. Uh, it just, yeah, so this was just an in-class demonstration. So I work large and then the students just work um, beside me or whatever. And I threw this little alphabet in because um, I found it in um, in Michael Gullett's book, Calligraphy. I think you might know it. If you don't know it, have a look at these little images, the next couple. I just I just find so much joy and so much human creativity in these little letters. They they're absolutely fantastic. They're sort of grotesque yet really um, fantastic. So I thought I'd share those little ones with you. Very quickly now. Edward Johnston, huge influence on my calligraphic career, as well as probably all of yours. Um, and the next image uh, that I've got of him, I love even more, I don't like this image, but I, I do love this next image. Oops, oops, let me go back. <laughs> Just, I must have pressed it in haste. But I particularly like this image because it tells a, a much better story, the one on the left with him and the cat. I don't know whether he's strangling the cat or whether he's giving it a nice little hug, but I'd say that he's probably saying, um, get off my drawing board. And um, Irene Wellington, of course, who I based my um, Churchill Fellowship on in 1991 when I went to study in the UK, uh, her work was... For me, um, she was a student of Edward Johnston's, of course. Um, you know, one of the greatest, her and Anne Heckel, one of the two greatest calligraphers of the 19, uh, the 20th century. And this piece of work that I actually have managed to see uh, in Lid, uh, the original, and it is quite large, as you would imagine, is unbelievably stunning. Um, I've studied it in books for years and years and years. To go there in 2019 was like you walk into the guild hall and I just, you get that goosebump feeling. You can see it, it's over there on the wall and you're just completely drawn to it. Um, uh, her, her, her forms, her, her, her versal forms, she was started to do things with letter form that you know, Edward Johnston would never have imagined or wanted her to do, I could probably say, uh, knowing a, a lot about their history. Uh, it's just the most superb piece of work. Um, and, uh, of course, Sheila, who came to Australia three times, and I also studied with her in Belgium. I mean, we've all got stories um, that we can talk about with Sheila and we all have our personal stories but a huge influence and continued and continued and continued to share um, her thoughts, um, her critical analysis, her, her love um, uh, right to the end of her life it had a huge influence on all of us um, as I know you know but this particularly beautiful photograph taken by Christine Titchener um, is very, very precious. So to the future, um, it's always nice taking photographs of wet ink. <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, the hands are willing. Well, as long as the hands are willing and the ink is still wet, 
Uh, I think I can go on for a little bit longer. And uh, I always finish with my grandkids with attitude. Somebody once who's uh, in this forum today, uh, you know, encouraged photographs with attitude. So now my grandchildren, we always have photographs with attitude. Um, so you haven't interrupted me to talk with me about anything. So I'd like to invite you to unmute yourself, uh, but also to thank you for <laughs> bearing with me for the last hour while I've shown you a whole mishmash of things. Gemma, this was really wonderful. Um, this is Evelyn. I had a couple of questions as you were going along and I completely forgot to unmute and ask. Oh. When, you were, when you were talking about squirrel, can you tell us a bit more about Schoolgirl Inc? Oh, uh, you know, um, Evelyn, I don't know about you, but when I went to school, we used to have little sachets about this big and in there was a powder and it was a blue ink in there. So you poured it, you put the powder into the jug and you filled it up with boiling water and only, well, not boiling water, hot water, and only certain children in the class were allowed to do it. So I've just called it Schoolgirl Ink um, because I don't know the name of it and I don't have any more sachets left. Um, I used the last one on the Blue Books of Love. I don't know of anybody, anybody here in the U.S. who's who use school um, sachets of ink. When I was learning to use a pen and ink, we used um, a bottle of ink. Ah, so um, I was born in 1956. And um, so by the time I got to school, we, was, we were still making the ink for the kids to use uh, for learning, for dip in pen and ink. And I actually learned italic I didn't learn um, any pointed pen work at all um, at school. Some parts of the country were using the copper plate nib and our part of the country was using, um, that was in Sydney, of course, italic. And yeah, only certain people, and I was one of them. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Teacher's uh, pet. That's it. I was the dirtiest kid. And as you know, I'm one of eight, one of nine children and, you know, I was often in the laundry and the, the nuns would say, you can't go back to your poor mother looking like that. And so they'd strip me and put an apron on me. They were really genuinely, you know, it's very kind. And they would launder my uniform and then put it back on me and send me home. How kind. <laughs> it's a great story. The other question I had was um, when you were talking about the box that was made to contain the two um, mm -hmm. books. I am yeah. not familiar with that word. Is it Solenda? Solanda. S-O-L-A-N-D-E-R, I think. Could be A-R, but E-R. S-O-L-A-N-D, Solanda box. And it's one of those archival boxes that has, you know, four sides, obviously. Right. And then when it shuts, it shuts with that beautiful whoosh sound. So that uh, it's just that real precious sound when you close the Solander box. But they're archival boxes. Thank um, you. I'm sure you can look it up now. I will. Mm -hmm. oh, I put a link in the chat to the Wikipedia entry about it. Thank you, Dina. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Dina. Gemma, this is Chris. Uh, that was so beautiful uh, from start to finish. Uh, uh, just wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, Chris, and, thank you. Um, I was wondering, so there was one where you had a substrate and then like red and gold mm -hmm. on top. And mm -hmm. it sounded like you scratched the letters. Is that what mm -hmm. you do? Yeah, like um, I, I call it the sgraffito effect mm -hmm. or technique, actually. And it, it's really quite simple. It's just, you've got your substrate and that can be paper, wood. Um, it could be plastic. I don't think you'd use plastic though. Anyway, and then and when I say wood, you can use chipboard or uh, what, masonite or what's that other one? Craft wood. And so you basically put an acrylic wash down and then you lay a 
gold size. So that can be anything from wonder size to um, ormaline, um, ormaline, ormaline, um, any type of gold size. And then when that's ready to be gilded, you gild that. And the really lovely thing about it is it takes on the texture of the substrate. So if you used a watercolor paper that had a rough substrate, that sorry, had a rough tooth or surface um, or a medium one, once you lay the, the paint and the size and the gold, it takes on that, that um, texture. And then when you allow that to sort of settle, <laughs> you can just start scratching through. And if you had multicolors in the background, you, as you scratch through, those multicolors start to um, reveal themselves. Hmm. Gemma, some impressive um, scratching. <laughs> yeah, what do you scratch with? And oh, does, okay. does the gold not chip or anything like that? It just <clears throat> stays um, No, I, so I just use a, a, burn, a, I use a very fine... Well, I've used two things over my um, calligraphic life. One was one of those temper tools, which is a, no, k my tools, which is a, a burnisher that is like a tapestry needle end, a thick, a thick end, um, not a pointed end. So I used to use one of those, but now I use a really, really fine little ball. It's so fine, you can hardly tell that it's a, a ball. And I just gently scratch through it. Um, oh. I'm not taking I'm not scratching through to so that the paper is being affected but I'm just sort of pushing the gold aside to reveal the color beneath so you were kind of building those let some of those letters by scratching 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 but building yeah so yeah. Carl's just popped one on the screen there you could have took that off the wall when when ink on a page becomes true passion oh yes okay Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's sweet. Hmm. I'm really thrilled to be here with you. How exciting. You taught Scrafito uh, in a Zoom class, I believe. I did. Sometime in the last three years. Are you ever going to teach it again? Um, just literally... I've just come out of teaching Scrafito for um, the Portland Society just two weeks ago. So there's uh, my answer. <laughs> sure, I will. You know, um, I, it's, it's just a technique. You should just have a go. Have a go. So it's just three layers. So you've got your substrate. You, I use acrylic color because if you use watercolor and then you're adding your gold size, it mixes together and blends and you lose the color. Whereas if I use an acrylic, when you add your gold size, it doesn't blend together. It's completely separate because acrylic is a plastic after all. And then um, just, just trial it. If you've, if you've got all of those things in your studio, Take them out and trial them. That's what I say. That's what I do. Um, Meredith? Meredith, you've got the floor. Okay. Um, while you're talking about classes and what you teach, um, well, I find all of the things that you showed us just so incredibly beautiful. But I... I my heart just gets taken by your layered Romans with a watercolor and I was wondering if you teach that as an online class or if that is more something that you need to do in person and um, it really is in person and I, the only reason I say that is because there's a lot of wet media and in my online classes I've got my zoom cameras sorry my um my document camera sitting right here sometimes so right on almost right on the work um yeah it really is an in-person I have not taught it via zoom put mm -hmm. it that way not yet um, <laughs> you know if the world comes to it then I, po I possibly you know to to such a state then I possibly would but it's it's once you know the technique and I learned the technique at this when I went to the school of art in Canberra 
and it was a watercolor technique. And of course, all my subject matter was letter forms. And my tutor wanted them all to be, you know, um, leaves and trees and still lifes. And, you know, and I sort of was a little bit of a rebel uh, and used letter form. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I had one other, you know, um, when you were showing your fracture and there was that you did the close up and there was that that little figure of a nun, I think it was in the middle of that. Um, had you painted that before or did you did you do the lettering first and then paint the figure in afterwards? It's um, so charming. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've done that quite a bit with some commissions where rather than sticking the person or the tree or the whatever it is outside of the text, um, I would do all the lettering first. And then basically, uh, that was Mary MacKillop, who is now a canonised saint. Mm -hmm. And so um, I then drew Mary MacKillop over the top of the lettering and I just painted her. And wherever the lettering was, I just left the tiniest moat around the the lettering um I, it, not because it would have run it wouldn't have because my ink that i use is waterproof when dry um so i always leave the moat so that the letters stand out and she stands out and uh yeah it, and i also did it again on that document with the they wanted a painting of um the cathedral in melbourne and i just i thought oh god this, this is a mess this document you've got so many wants um, so I, I did the same with it. I drew it after I did the lettering, but it sits behind the letters. Thank you. It was very effective the way that Thank it was you. done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Gemma, um, in the uh, Ben Johnston quote, I think it was Ben Johnston, the quote yeah. about um, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. How did you do the gradated purple and amber letters in that quote? They were beautiful. Thank you. Um, it's just watercolor. Um, and basically you start with one color and you move down the letter, draw up the letters, which were, by the way, of course, um, um, what were they? <laughs> Come on. What's the word I'm looking for? They were... Um, Versals, uh, they were Norland letters. Oh, so okay. basically, uh, I just drew the letters and then started painting from one corner, pulling it right across the top of the letter, uh, and then for bringing, putting my uh, more paint into the pool and bringing the pool down, and then slightly adding a little bit of the other color as I get to the middle. I did never make them perfectly cut through the middle, but the the ochre color was it was Indian yellow actually. Or was it yellow ochre and purple? Um, I'd start to add that halfway down so that it gets that mixing meld. And then, you know, there has to be a little bit of trickiness going on. And so I might get some clean my paintbrush so that I'm now starting to bring in the a heavier or a stronger colour at the bottom. Um, it's just a, it's just a matter of melding the colour as I paint down. And then with so many letters, Shakespeare to try to get it, I didn't try to get them even, I just worked them as I could, bouncing off the letter before. I see, thank you. That was a big job, not um, 80 lines, oh please. <laughs> and the piece that you showed by Irene Wellington, uh, was it Bailiff's Lid or something like that? Yeah, Where, the Bailiff's that? of Lid. Bailiff's of Lid. Oh, please look it up. It's just the most amazing piece of work. And it's there in the Guildhall for all to see. You just have to go to Lyd, South East Anglia, East Anglia. Oh, okay. And I have to thank Tina Warren for taking me there. Uh, we've been great friends for many years and uh, the two of us, popped on down to Lid, and the mayor was so happy to see somebody interested in the calligraphy on the wall that he put the mayoral, mayoral chains around my neck and I thought, oh, my God, I think I'm going to fall over. They were so heavy. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's very exciting to walk into a room and see work like that. We've all experienced that. Is that L-E-E-D? 
Oh, lid. Sorry, it might be my Antipodean accent. <laughs> um, L Y double D. Thank you. Gemma, I saw your piece in the Washington Guild's latest um, scripts it, and you showed it today. And I just love your versals, as you know, which you. you taught that at Ghost Ranch. And oh, Wasn't that gosh, the it changed my life. Um, oh. And and so, um, but I was just thinking of those beautiful, flourishy, um, vivacious versals and how how you put together those two the more the red was in more reserved and then the other just flowing. It was very, very lovely. And it just made me think of that class and how much fun it was doing that and then making it your own, like you said. Yeah. I, I try to encourage people, don't don't do it as it's mine, do it as right. it's yours. Yeah. I mean, that's our job. Our job is to study the past and move forward quite right. simply. Um, yeah. So, friends. It was fabulous. We loved it. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Very fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for doing this for us. Um, it was a real treat for everybody. It was um, a treat for me. Um, Gemma's uh, website, I'm going to put it in the chat. Check it out. She's got a beautiful website. And um, and I believe she has classes on the website, or she her posted your schedule on the website, perhaps. Yeah, they're all there. Yeah. And uh, the next Black Letter Brunch will be on um, May, I think it will be on May 14th, Sunday, May 14th, which is Mother's Day. I'm not sure if it will be on the 14th or the 28th, but I will send out a reminder with the correct date on it um, shortly before um, the brunch starts. And, um, and uh, I will be posting the recording of the Black Letter Brunch on YouTube and sending out the link um, after, the, uh, after this is over. So for those of you who couldn't, couldn't attend or who might, may have missed part of it. Um, uh, did anyone else have any more questions for me or for Gemma? Meredith, can I just, this isn't a question. Can we all just wish Claude an early happy birthday? <laughs> Before, what day is Wonderful it? Wonderful idea. Whoop. Whoops, yeah, Claude, you? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Claude. So, 93 on, what is it, April? 16th, 18th? 18th. You're muted. Yeah, you're muted, Car. You're muted, Claude. I can't hear anything. Yeah, 18th. 18th. Oh. 18th oh. of April. Okay. Oh. Any oh, happy year's ride. So happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And I will um, send out the recording later on today. And thank you very much to Gemma. Yeah. I appreciate you taking thank you. Uh, taking your morning very early <laughs> to, uh, to talk to us. It was yeah. fascinating. And thank you, Raul. That's Raul. Raul. <laughs> I'll get it one day. <laughs> Thank you. Without you, we wouldn't be doing it. So wonderful. Thank you, Raul. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Gemma. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gemma.